Hey, you. Hey, you. Come on, sit down. You're sitting at the Growing Ups Table, and I'm your host, Jesse Pimpinella, and as always, my partner in crime, John Jacobs. Thank you so much, and a happy Wednesday, everybody, and we are back. We are back. I am back. We are back, baby. And better than ever. And better than ever, man. We're so excited. Uh, we took a couple weeks off just because a lot was happening for all of us, project-wise, touring-wise, all kinds of stuff. But now we're, we got a full schedule of things we're going to do. And today, we're going to be talking about the future movie theaters. You know, I mean, you look at streaming killed Blockbuster. Now streaming is now killing movie theaters. Or could they be coming back? We don't know. Mm. We have some discussion. I mean, if you bring in drive-ins because of COVID. But. Before we get into all those great discussions and debates, I need you to do me a favor real quickly. Number one, if you're watching on Facebook right now, share it and like it and make sure you comment your thoughts and opinions because we like to discuss them. Um, and make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube page where all new episodes appear on there the next day on Thursday. So be sure to check that out and catch up on past episodes. All right. We talked about Cobra Kai and I know some of you guys are finishing up a Cobra Kai. Now you can watch our episode. So there you go. Yeah, what a great show. I went back and I'm I'm back on season four again. I blew through it again, man. I just yeah. wanted to watch it all the way through again. I think what I'm going to do is each time a season ends, then I'm just going to go through the whole series up through that season again. And then That's I'll be good for when the next one rolls out. That's exactly what I do with most shows. That is, that is a healthy dieting of movies and mm -hmm. TV shows, as I call it. But and let's just admit real quick, season two is the best. Okay, just it is. It is. It, it really it is. is. I, I like back I and all, I mean it's I love them all equally, but I can I can but I can lean more on the guy who has the straight A's. All right. That's Season all. three though, really equally. I love it. I don't care. I love it. Mm. Well here's the thing. Y'all, y'all watched the, the second season on Netflix. You waited what? Maybe a, a half. Oh, uh, 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 false, sir. False. I, 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 I have had YouTube red since it was a thing. Okay, because, all right, all right. Because then I had my Google Play, which I much prefer than they converted over to uh, Your YouTube opinion music, is valid. Which is annoying. So your, yeah, slow down a little bit. Your okay? opinion is valid. My bad. I I over I I uh, jumped over the the line there. But speaking of jumping over the line, this next guy, uh, this man knows how to jump over a line, man. This guy, I mean, I say that because when we were <laughs> celebrating your birthday party. This guy was whispering so much funny shit to me. Oh, yeah. And I, I was trying not to laugh because I was in a position where I should not be laughing because the person that was the subject of this stuff was nearby. But this guy is hilarious. This guy is the reason this thing is even a thing. All right. Please give it up for our good friend, our brother in, uh, in Airwaves. Give it up. For Mr. Vance, the producer. Woo -woo, there he is. Look at him with his cigar, man. Oh my god, I'm so. Vance, uh, what uh, what cigar do you have tonight? What's your cigar That's choice? A, it's an Arturo Fuente. Um, I was actually riding a little low. I went to our local smoke shop, our local haberdashery, if you will, and uh, surprisingly, they had a very tiny little um, uh, what do you call it? Humidor, a walk-in. And I was like, "Oh, okay, that's surprising." So you know, I was, you know, you, you know, we, we have a big snowstorm coming up here in yep. this area, and uh, you know, you gotta you gotta stock up. You know, you gotta get all of your, <laughs> your cigars, bread and eggs into their fucking cart. Eggs, <laughs> corn, you know, you gotta get it in all there. into you know to be able to last. You know, two days, which is really <laughs> right. what it's going to deal with. You know, it's like, oh Jesus, you know, let's go into the fucking Kroger and act like the fall of Saigon. You know, people just taking everything off the shelf. <laughs> but Vance is still going to get his cigar. So. But, you know, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's one other person in the house, and she wants to live. So you know, I've got to have a cigar. So I have a question, Vance. So let's go with your scenario. There's pandelirium going on. Places are being looted. You're trying right. to find the cigars. Let's mm. just say that the standard pack of Swisher Sweet cigars are the only ones left. 
do you take them or do you pass them up? Well, of course I take them, John. I'm an addict. You know, I mean, you know. Okay. It, I just it, wanted to be sure, okay, because I didn't think you were a snob. I mean, you, you kind of are, but, you know, oh, if not. Push, push came to shove, you're not going to turn down the cigar no matter what it is. Right. I mean, that's what I'm dealing with. I mean, if you ask a crack addict, you know, do you want 90% pure, you know, crack or do you want – and if there's nothing else, would you take 15%? They're going to take the 15%, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the way addiction works, John. I, I can't help it. You know, I'm well, not a scientist. Know, <laughs> really you hey. know, the, the dealers have the two-for-one deals worked out to where they still profit – much like how we're going to talk about how movie theaters work. But before we get into that, I want to go over with my beer of choice for the evening. What is your beer of choice, John? Well, I finally got a six-pack of the 10-ton stout from Warped Wing, and this is hard to find. And this is actually the maple pecan, and I'll tell you, it's delicious. And I know a lot of people are probably scared off because of the maple and the pecan flavor. Uh, it's not intense at all. This stout is actually a little bit less chocolatey than Guinness's. It allows you to taste the maple and the pecan aftertaste versus when you're taking the initial drink. And it is very, very enjoyable. So I highly recommend it. Warped Wing Brewery, they're a great company. But this in particular, mm, I'm loving it. Chocolatey maple pecan. Yeah, about the beer. I think someone what? else has the I'm loving it look slogan. <laughs> uh, they don't use that anymore, sir, so it's fair game. All right, fine. You had me at the re YouTube red thing. You had me at that. I know. Yeah. I'm over two right now. I'm going to back off. <laughs> but anyways, what were you going to say, Vance? Chocolatey maple pecan. Why don't you just get a fucking pancake and, and you know, drink it with some – and eat it with some, some, I don't know, some whiskey, all right? I mean, th th that – I don't even, I don't even get that. <laughs> Man, I just told you it doesn't have the chocolatey flavor that Guinness has. And I said what? that the maple and the pecan was very low to where it's not noticeable and therefore it is enjoyable. It's like you didn't hear anything I said. It, I mean, I, I, I'm hearing chocolatey. You don't, you're not getting the chocolatey. You're getting the maple and the pecan. But I said it's not intense and you get it in the aftertaste. So it's, it, it, but it's still present. It's still present. It's there. Are you I mean, really going to argue on a beverage that I'm enjoying? Guys, there's only one way to settle this, yes, is that we have to go on air another time and drink this together. Oh, we, 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 could do a, we could do an episode where we just drink the whole time yeah, we, we, and we'll argue about, about who likes what. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. So that's Vance, what we'll have to do. We'll bring I up. think we might have to get the Weller out for that episode because you I know, know what happens when the Weller comes out. That's, that would be a tough one, but yeah, I mean, and plus, you know, be like a finish a bottle in an hour challenge, uh, you know. Look, so, John and Vance, it's it's a rough time when the when the Weller comes out. The so. hell's the Weller? Oh, uh, Jesse doesn't know. We got to introduce him to it. He has no Dude, idea. I feel like the guy from Hot Tub Time Machine when they keep saying the Great White Buffalo. Yep. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Dude, you don't even know about the Weller, and that's oh. okay. We'll introduce you to it, and then then you'll be in the club, and you'll know. All right, I'm I, I can I, I'm down for that. So let's, let's get on ahead. with this show. We got viewers. They're ready to go. They're ready, ready to, to go. go on. Well, we let's were talking about movies. So it looks like everybody's down for the whiskey episode. I'm, I'm oh, Tom. Yeah, there you go. Tom's drink is a four locos. <laughs> yeah. Wait. Wait a second. You aren't drinking every show. Wow. You. <laughs> that, that <should> be... <laughs> I just started laughing. Oh man. You know. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. And don't worry, Tom. We saw your other comment. We're going to be talking about that in a second. But right now, we're going to talk about the future of movie theaters. All right? What will happen? Will we finally decide if it's the R before the E or the E before the R? We don't know. We don't know. I mean, right now, COVID changed everything. March 2020, sure uh, you know, before you would pack that place like sardines. Now I'm buying four seats just to keep two away from me. All right. It's an insane <laughs> concept now. Movie theater, but, but, but this to me, I always felt that movie theaters were on this decline a little bit. Only because, only because everything that is successful, that hits that so-called billion dollar club. It, that movie has to be an event. It has to be monumental. It's got to be something that brings people to the theaters. And and I think COVID now up that. Like it was already a challenge, but now it's even higher. So you got people like Ridley Scott blaming 
Marvel movies for Oh Netflix. God. Uh not to cut you off, but to go right in line with that. Did you see uh Vance and Jesse? I think it was today or yesterday, uh director of Independence Day, totally the oh, yeah. the guy's name. He was bitching Rolling about it. Yeah, he was bitching about it, saying Marvel's ruining everything. I'm like, uh, maybe you should look at your filmography first before you start throwing stones. Because I mean, movie, you had some good ones, but for, <laughs> when the movie you're known for is over thirty <laughs> years old, almost. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, what, what'd she say? She said it's not that great. Oh, no, hold, hold on, hold on, Jesse. Oh, wife. hold on a second. God, all right. The first Independence Day is fantastic. Now, okay. we pretend like resurgence <laughs> doesn't exist. Because I went to the theater and spent theater money on it because I played the goddamn mobile strategy game for two months. And I felt like I owed them the ticket for the enjoyment I got out of the game until I hit the paywall and stopped playing it. So, I went uh, to the theater and saw that trash. Vance, go ahead. Point of, point of order, you don't have to say the first Independence Day, all right? No one gave a fuck about the second Independence they Day. Did, it is, man. It, they did. No one gave a shit about that movie, right, man. So it, it, it is the only one. Independence Day, quite honestly. And and you, know it was a big deal at the time. I saw it in the theater, too. And you know what? It was one of those things that was like, it's really great to see in the theater. But to me, it was a movie that didn't really stand the test of time. And Roland Emmerich really didn't stand the test of time. 1997's Godzilla will tell you right then and there that Roland Emmerich didn't stand the test of time. He didn't even make it to his next blockbuster. So he, he could show up. So. But that's my <laughs> point. But that's my point. The, 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 the movie he's known for, I mean, look, if I had to, I think you measure how good of a director is based on how far, how short it was from their last hit movie. Like, oh, if you I get John Favreau. John Favreau. When's the, what's the last thing he's been killing at? Boba Fett, all right? A, a new episode came out today. Fucking beautiful. I didn't get to watch it yet, and I know we're going to do gonna a Boba anything. Fett show, but I just want to say I love it, and I'm sorry that a couple of my friends really, really, really hate it and can't get past that because I am absolutely enjoying the hell I'm out of for it. it. I. It's it they 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 chose it. I knew it wasn't going to be a Mandalorian show. It was, right, it, was, it had to be different. This is and this is different. It what this is? It's a it, it's an organized crime. Yep. Organized crime. I'm like fucking hey, I'm all for. It. But anyways, we want to get into that. Point is, you look at this guy rolling. What's the last best thing he did? What was his magnus? It's like it's far away. It's gone. You know what I mean? So I mean, I don't know. That's my thought on it. But let's go back to um, the future movie theaters. Right. I think the future, if movie theaters want to survive, is that they need monumental films. Like, Spider-Man Homecoming is a great example. Monumental. Sure. Great example. You had three generations of Spider-Man, three generations uh, of people who grew up on Spider-Man, all together in one theater. Every If you were in that theater when that when they I came was. on screen. It was amazing. It was like a sport event. Yeah, it was. It, everybody <laughs> cheered. Everybody cheered in the theater Everyone. when Andrew Garfield jumped out of the portal and you realized it was him. Everybody was like, oh, shit. Like, it just erupted, man. It was great. But it, but see, that's the thing. That's the energy directors need to bring to yeah, their movies. I agree. You, you know, because, like, here, no offense, no offense. I'm sure The Last Duel was good. I'm sure it was. But But here's the thing. And, and, and he's bitching like all oh, these movies are. Do you think Marvel ruined Tarantino's career? No. Tarantino has an audience carved out. Right. He, he catered to his fans. He took care of his fans. So when you see Tarantino next to the movie name, you're like, oh, we're in for a good time. Yeah, I know what I'm I getting mean, into. Here's the thing. And, and this might be unpopular. Never once have I ever heard anybody go, dude, you see that new Spielberg trailer? <laughs> I mean, at one time we did that at in the time. 80s up to the mid in 90s, but then it, then it fizzled out, you know. Yeah, but I mean, I mean like, he got his awards and, you know, he did it. Yeah. So, you know. But, but that's what I mean. It's like that you you need persona and personality. You need some charm with their movies. If it, Nowadays, people want authenticity. That's why these TikTok videos go crazy. But, Vance, I've been talking for a long time. What are your thoughts on the future of movie theaters? Well, um, I did want to go back to one thing you said, Jesse, talking about, you know, what were movie theaters dying before then? 
and uh, thanks to uh, Box Office Mojo uh, website. I love that so website, we, man. <laughs> you can you can track you know down to you know monthly releases over the past twenty years, and when you look at the over yearly numbers, we're looking at pretty steady numbers for the most part. And then we started getting into a stratosphere that didn't really surprisingly coincide with the Marvel universe, where we were getting numbers around nine and a half billion billion dollars in yearly revenue from uh, box office box office numbers then the moving into the 10 uh, high 10s and then the 11 then the 11s 2018 and 2019 you were getting 11 billion 889 million 2019 11 billion 320 million so we honestly movie theaters were still churning out big big bucks right. now let me, you're right let me, you're right but let me recant my thought i want to recant my thought because you're absolutely right you're not wrong Real quick before you do that put up tom's comment he is displeased with something that you just said jesse oh oh jesse in trouble oh i'm sh tom uh tom elaborate we want to know what it is we do because i hey i could be wrong I'm never going to be act like I'm right. I'm not no dumb. I don't think you meant it that way, man. <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah. No, wait. Real. So what I want to just say, recant my thought, because I am wrong, and I want to recant. Okay. Um, the theaters, they were on a steady decline uh, going up. My issue was I was talking about niche market, and now, like, because basically those movies that were dominating were a lot of Marvel movies, Star right. Wars movies, mm -hmm. like like these movies that bring fans together and and, and everybody loves. I'm, what I'm trying to say is movies like The Phantom Thread <laughs> wasn't driving people out. You know, like oh my god, we got to see Daniel Day Lewis in this. You know, like, hey, 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 you be careful. You be very <laughs> careful, sir. <laughs> Tread careful. lines today. Oh no one, God. no one talks ill about Daniel Day Lewis when I'm around. All right, I'm not he's a bad actor, but I'm just saying. I'm just Be saying. careful, sir. He's I'm in one of my trying. favorite movies of all time. Yeah, yeah Last of the Mohicans. You got it. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, to just point, no one about to see the boxer that he starred in. I mean, that, I think that made like three hundred thousand dollars, shown hey. in only one day in Ireland. You know, so hey. but did I mean, he bring it? Did he bring it? Of course he did. He, there you, you go. Know, he was the man of bringing it, but. You, you know, bring the audience <laughs> doesn't matter. He brought it to the <laughs> He puts everything into his performances. Anyway, so I don't he want to get does. on the Daniel Day Lewis soapbox, but I I love the guy. One of my favorite <laughs> actors. There you go, Al. Exactly. You look real quick. Last the Mohicans ending. Find me another ending that ends with a ten minute emotional roller coaster that that film ends on. Find me one. You can't I'm, do it. I'm not saying. Look, in the heyday of movie theaters, that was that was the box office pullers. It just what I'm saying now. I wish I could have seen that in the theater. I really do. I and if they ever release it, I'm there. Vance, I'm dragging you with me. Let's run a theater. And watch it. Let's do it. Anyways, um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I, you're you're right, Jesse. I mean. Absolutely. When we started seeing in the 90s, we started seeing the trend toward um, properties that could sustain longer. And you saw, you saw it right off the bat with Jurassic Park. And that, you know, granted Jurassic Park was only one novel, but it was like, okay, how this is something we can use and we can use multiple times over. And then finally, someone at Sony got the bright idea, say, hey, you know what? We've got these comic book licenses that we've been sitting around forever with. Let's put out an X-Men movie, and then let's do a Spider-Man movie. And then the world started to come undone. It was already started in the process because Peter Jackson was already in the process of making Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And now, you know, so then when we start getting into the 2000s, it's all about these materials that they can yeah. use, that have tons of background on. Yep. And, you know, yes, it, it is going to hurt a lot of uh, a, a lot of people. It's going to hurt a lot of filmmakers, but in a way, streaming is giving the, those opportunities more. Sure, the, the Irishman would never have been made by Martin Scorsese for a theater if it had not a, had the opportunity to go to Netflix right off the bat. No one was saying, "You know, we need a three hour, half hour long mob film with all I these guys that have been in there before." I think Scorsese's name could have carried it. See, Scorsese's a name. Scorsese's He's a name. But he doesn't. He's, his name typically has not been box office gold. In fact, you know the, there I, are a lot of ah! issues. Like, John, trust me on those numbers. You can pull up those numbers right now. He's it, actually right. Good, he's Goodfellas. Right. I mean, to me, probably the 
the second greatest Scorsese, Scorsese film of all time, and probably the one everyone has always already seen. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, number one overall in the box office for 1988, 89. Yeah. It, it, it was a good film and a lot of people saw it, but it had its afterlife really in rental. Yes. And that's when everybody got to see it. Um, but, you know, you know, Scorsese, I, you know, I don't think that would have been a film that, you know, grossed $300 million in its first week or anything like that. We, we yeah. have to go, we have to live with the fact that we're going in these numbers, uh, these, these, these times where people are all going to go to the movie theater. If it's something they know that they need to see in the movie theater and a lot ah, of stories, yep. A lot of story-driven movies necessarily are going to be that film. Um, one one more number here I wanted to put up just to show how bad this got. In 2019, uh, second quarter was uh, the cumulative gross of all films was three billion two hundred sixty-one million dollars. Uh, Endgame pushed the envelope. I was going to say that had to have been like an Avengers release or something like yep. that because that probably carried almost half of that of those numbers. 2020 gross second quarter four million yeah because nobody went to the theater man no but i mean nobody. and you can look at the releases i mean the, the you know anniversary of jaws anniversary of this they they knew it this is this is it it's over um and we're, we're a little bit better now we're at 811 million in uh q2 of 2021 we'll have to see what q2 looks like coming up i'm gonna have to actually pull up here what we are getting in q2 of this year but and i know this is probably something we have on the agenda here but the the idea that you know what we're going to keep these movies in the can until everything gets better shit ain't getting better all right so and, yeah. and you, you can see as americans as americans, americans we don't care about this covid anymore all right yeah, we're done with it. Fuck COVID. Yeah, that's what go it. everywhere we're done <laughs> And and Spider Man yeah, bolted out. Done. We're done with. It. We beat it. We're good. <laughs> we won. We won. <laughs> but Spider Man bore that out. Spider Man was packing theaters. Like oh, you yeah. know, it was packing asses in like like nobody's business. Like we hadn't seen in in almost two years. And I, that's good yeah. right now. The people will still do it, but it's got to be a, something that they know is going to be worthwhile in this yes. first movie to hit a billion since 2019. Yep. Oh, was uh, was Spider Man? Yep. Yeah, yeah. The billion absolutely. Dollar Club came back with them. That was, uh, it was real quick. I want to. Uh, uh, Tom updated us, and Tom hit me in the feels with who he meant by Dawson. Yes, he meant Dawson Leary from Dawson's Creek. Because remember, Dawson was a huge Spielberg fan. Yeah. It was driving his movie passion. And I don't give a shit what anybody says. I fucking love that show. And it might be time for another run through. It's been a couple of years. <laughs> I need to revisit Cape Side again. <laughs> and then uh, another movie, Unforgiven. See, Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood is a name. That's a name in movies. That sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, before we transition to some of the more specific talking points that we had, just kind of yeah. my thoughts on this is, I mean, obviously, we no longer – really have rental stores anymore because we've moved from analog to digital to information now right and so of course that's going to wipe out physicality going somewhere when you can stay in the convenience of your home it was only a matter of time before it impacted the cinema now the cinemas have had deals with distributor uh, distributors who have deals with studios and we all know that the theater doesn't make money on the tickets it's something like 50% or less because yeah. that has to go to the distributor which then has to go to the studio and get split all up in this crazy shit they make their money on the concessions man theaters are in the business of selling concessions and they will sell you that 10 bag of popcorn that costs them 10 cents and not even feel bad about it. I think the last time Vance and I went to see a film together, I don't remember what it specifically was, but it was at an AMC because we got double Jack and Cokes and the bill was like $40 for like uh, Jack and Cokes. Was that the, when we got drunk and watched Superman? Uh, n no, the, that was at Easton. This was, was a different one. Yeah, but we, did, we did drink there too. We did drink. <laughs> we did drink. Anytime we go to a movie, we drink. Um, mm. But it I was, drank it was during the, a Sonic movie. That yeah, was it, was, it was a it was a different film. But so you know, obviously, 
the theater business recognizes that people want to stream because it's convenient and they don't want to spend all the money. I mean, think about it. A family of three going to the movie theater is like 50 or 60 bucks. Easy. Maybe more. Dude, my wife and I could go out and have a decent steak at Mitchell's for around that same price, you know? And it's just a one shot. It's a two hour thing and you're done. Yeah, you've got the experience, but what do you have after that, right? At least if I'm home and I stream the film, I got it for 24 hours, 48 hours. I can fall asleep, watch it again, finish it, show it to somebody else when they come over, whatever it is. It's about the convenience. And we knew that that was eating in a little bit. But films like Marvel films and Fast and Furious and Star Wars and Jurassic Park, they make up for that with these billion and billion and billion dollar revenues. But now that we have COVID, it's different. And studios are adjusting. They're shrinking that period where they can have a film exclusively before it's available for streaming or before it's on 4K Blu-ray. And they now pay out different amounts to the distributor and the studio to adjust for that. Because for so long, I mean, if you remember Vance back in the day, you could watch a movie in the early 90s in the theater and you couldn't buy it on VHS for like five years after. You had to wait forever. <laughs> now it's like 90 days or less. But this has been a constant power struggle and it's taken a lot to get to these deals and studios like universal have said, we want to do digital and film release same day. And then they almost got kicked out of like Cinemark and Regal for that. Like it's this whole big dramatic thing because everybody wants to make money, but at the same time, we as the consumers just want to watch the entertainment. And at this point, I don't fucking care if I see it in the theater or at my home or on my phone. It really doesn't matter. I just want to watch the fucking movie. And I'm going to be honest, I'm more I'm more selective now than ever in going to the theater, not just because of COVID. And look, I braved it to go see Spider-Man. I broke my rule and I braved it to go see Spider-Man. I appreciate that guy sitting next to me who had his mask on the whole time I had mine on. <laughs> yep. Nonetheless. So... You know, I'm going to evaluate that before I go. And if I don't feel like there's value, I'm going to fucking watch it at home. I am so happy that I didn't go see that piece of shit Matrix movie in the theater. I would have been irate. I was already pissed off that they ruined the Matrix for no reason at all. Then you put on theater money on that. Oh, I would I'd still be talking about I kind of am, but you get what I'm saying. So <laughs> we now live in this world where we can get digital releases of the film same time, couple weeks later, month later. Now it's on Blu-ray, less than 90 days. These things are becoming more available. And I see the future as a hybrid. I don't think the theater model is gonna go away. There's no. always going to be some way to watch a film on a big screen, whether that's the drive-in, whether that's an independent one-screen theater like the uh, State Theater in London, which Vance and I like to visit, whether that's the multiplex AMC around the corner from my house that has 10 digital screens, or if that's the DTS theater that they have at Easton that costs 20 bucks a ticket, but it's the best experience you'll ever have. There's something for everybody, but in order for all of this to work, we need to find that balance and we haven't necessarily found that balance yet. I think the concept is there, but it's not in practice yet. And I'm going to expand on that in the example when we talk about Black Widow, because I think that right there kind of solidifies that talking point with what happened with that film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I basically I, I agree with because the model ain't going to go away. I mean, the theater is built for special things like to be seen on the bigger screen. Mm -hmm. The drive-in is you, you know, the drive-in. That's an experience. That's something that brings you out. It's you know, sitting out in the summer air and watching a movie. That those are experiences, and that's that. That was a good way to tie it together, John. That perfect way to bring it together. Uh, let's let's move on to our next topic, though. Uh, uh, right now, because man, we took a, we ate a chunk up, so we're gonna. Have we to we did. We'll we we'll, we these. I think we'll be able now that we kind of got the big thing out of the way. Uh, yeah. We'll be able to go into this. Ah, interesting topic. So this here. is an interesting number that Ghostbusters twenty twenty one grossed the same amount as Ghostbuster twenty sixteen. Again, different relatively the same amount. Different uh, variables of how that happened, but this happened. Now, uh, I'm not sure if one of you two want to go first with this. Vance, you want to go or you want me to go? No, no, I don't want to go. Okay. So, Vance, 
Vance and I I'm and our good friend. I'm not a big Ghostbusters guy, so I'm not, you know, I'm not going to have the, the passion to talk about it. So Vance and I and our good friend of the show, Charles Wien, a.k.a. Uh, Wild Charles, uh, the three of us went to go see Ghostbusters 2016. We were very disappointed. Um, we've now seen Ghostbusters Afterlife. Uh, most of the fan base agreed that was kind of the sequel we were looking for. But the interesting thing is, is with as much positive feedback as it got, and like everybody I know went to go see it, but yet it only grossed around the same amount as 2016. And I think that's really a good example of how the, the our situation with the pandemic and COVID can impact things. You know, we can guesstimate what it would have made if this was, let's say, 2017. But, <clears throat> excuse me. There's really no way to know because you're just guessing on trends. And while that can lead to some probability, it's not a, it's not fact because it didn't happen. So you have no idea what would have happened. But I think any rational person would understand that there wasn't a pandemic. This movie probably would have made more money. So I think it's a good example of, of two films that are on opposite ends of the spectrum but yet they did about the same amount of money. So that speaks volumes to those films that are in the middle. It's not a Hollywood Avengers blockbuster, but it's not a slow moving independent, you know, drama film either. It's that in the middle movie. And I think those in the middle films are the ones that are getting hit like Ghostbusters. Avengers is fine. They're going to make their money. Little independent films, smaller films, dramas, little comedies, their budget, everything worked out. They're going to be fine. It's those middle of the road films that I think are, are taking the biggest hit thoughts. Um, so what my thoughts on that is, and this is what I always talk about. I think some movies have too much of a, of a budget and Ryan sure. Reynolds agreed with this fact. Sure. When he made Deadpool and Deadpool two, they wanted to sho shove a shitload of money in those movies. And he said, no, let's keep it right here. And because he didn't want it to get so out there, he didn't want it to get it mm -hmm. so that it was effects driven too hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it, look at the films. They were great. Yeah. And they were great because he wanted to focus on the writing, the acting, the directing. And it was good. The second one moved me. And that's the result. I think when you are under constraints as a filmmaker, you get your best material. I, and I truly believe that. Like uh, in Jaws, they wanted to show there's a scene. Again, it's infamous. You know, they didn't want to show the shark that much. But there was a scene where they wanted to show the shark. But they couldn't because they were like, ah, this angle is not going to work. It's not going to work. So they're like, what if, what if they, we shoot the shark with the harpoon and it's connected to the barrel? And they're like, yeah, we'll try it. See if that works. And it did. And it was scary when you were seeing that. You're like, oh shit, the barrel's moving. The shark's nearby. So it was, it was something made out of necessity. I think that's something that some of these movies need to go back to doing, going back to those basics. I think one of the reasons why Ghostbusters 2021, I think was so much better than the other one is because I cared about these characters. I actually care about it. Grace kind of held that movie together. Oh, she did. Every and everybody admits it. Oh my she god, she held it together. Everybody he, knows it. It, it, it. That's just a true statement. He locked it down the whole way, start yeah. to finish. Yeah. She was Egon's granddaughter through and through. Yeah. You, yeah. So, but but again, the movie hinged upon her performance, and they it paid off. <laughs> paid off. Any final thoughts before we move on to our next one? Throw up this comment from uh, uh, Darth's brother um, where he's talking about the theater because I, I you know, I, I definitely understand with what he's saying, you know? Um, There's this, oh, this one? Yeah. Well, and any of them really, but th yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly what we were talking about earlier. We're just the, the overall cost and then just the, the, the burden of going and, and getting situated and everything. And then making sure that you pick a movie to make sure that you're not let down and don't feel like you wasted all of your money. Like I, I get what William's saying. Like it's, I get yeah. it. Like I, I definitely understand what he's saying. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, with these movies, yeah, like I said, uh, I, Hollywood, I think, is learning now that they need to really shell it out in yes. order to get us to come back, which I think is the weirdest positive thing that comes from COVID with this. Because in a weird way, because like Spider-Man No Way Home, they were writing that movie as they were directing it. They were rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it, because they were like, oh, we got something better. Oh, we got something better. But again, those are people that were super passionate about their project and gave a shit about what they were putting out. And that's how I mean – 
Are you trying to say that the writers of Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5 didn't have passion when they were rewriting in between scenes too? <laughs> Especially that dinner table scene? It's, uh, it's debatable. It's, it's Throw, debatable. Just throwing that out there. Um, One second. I wanna, oh, oh, I'm going to piggyback on, on something Jesse just brought up. So yeah. um, while they might be equitable numbers when it came to uh, the uh, – the, the box office numbers for both both Ghost, Ghostbusters. That's a tough one for me to say. <laughs> um, estimated budget on Ghostbusters 2016, 144 million. Ghostbusters Afterlife budget, 75 million. Yeah, it was a much lower budget. It really right. was. And look at the film they produced for that lower budget, right? It, again, like I said, I mean, that's why I think some movies need to go back to their roots. Of being uh, these low budget movies. I mean, look at the Halloween, the for Halloween twenty eighteen. It was on a ten million budget. I know you don't agree with it, but ten million dollar budget. I think it would have been <laughs> shittier if the budget was higher. Yeah, I, you know what? Maybe they could have afforded a good writer, and it wouldn't have had a oh, Doctor okay, Evil death right. trap ending, I, and it might I have been better. Said it. I shouldn't even said it. But, but you, Lord, well, hey, John, John, guess what? They're releasing a second twenty eighteen Halloween. It's called Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What? <laughs> what? Did you see the trailer for it? Another one? They been, Netflix is making a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, and it's oh. coming out this February. And guess what? They ripped off 2018. Wait, wait. You said this February, so you mean this month we are in this physically? Month. This month. Oh, God. I thought they learned their what? lesson with that 3D reboot movie. Get this. Get where this. he was just locked Sally? in his aunt's basement the whole time. Get this. Sally is back. And she's been waiting 50 years to fight. You're Levin fucking Six. with me. You're fucking I'm with me. I'm not. Oh, fucking my with God. Me. Watch the, the trailer joke. after this. Oh, God. Vance, I mean, I'm going to watch the movie, but I'm not happy about this. Vance, the you joke. know how much I love the original film. So I'm very upset about this. Yeah. They I, made, I, so basically, I, what? Sorry. Uh, uh, John, wait till we get the four-hour Whedon verse uh, version <laughs> of Chainsaw Massacre. Dude, then we can start, really get into he's that. not going to be making any more movies. He's <laughs> got a bunch colorful. of shit he's got to work through now. The color, the color palette's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the blood's going to be so crimson. It's going to be so crimson. <laughs> We're going to have a four-hour streaming version of everything now. <laughs> <laughs> but I promise you, I'm not lying to you. That Texas Chainsaw movie I'm talking about right now, that's the trailer, and everybody can literally back me up with that. That is, it's 2018 Halloween all the way. But anyways, let's go back to let's get back to the Ghostbusters thing. Any closing thoughts on this before we move on? Uh, just what Vance said. You know, obviously the budget was almost half. So there, in terms of profitability, you know, there's clearly a difference there. Plus the marketing. Um, you know, the, while they did market Afterlife, it was not marketed to the degree 2016 was marketed. So clearly there's money and lack thereof spent there and stuff. But we were just, you know, comparing the box office results. And clearly the box office results were impacted because of COVID. Um, I don't know what you have for the next topic in order, but I think this would be really good to transition into the Black Widow thing. It is the next one. Okay. So this is kind of what we're talking about with... COVID releases, holding films back, making the money. And there's one thing about the film industry that I, I really can't stand. Look, I get that Scarlett Johansson and Disney had a contract. I don't, I don't dispute that. They had a contract. Okay? I get that. They violated that contract. I get that. She had a right to sue. I get that. However... The figures involved are bullshit because they're all based off of projections and guesses, not facts. So here's the reality of the situation. Disney did the dual release and they made whatever it was, 300 some thousand. I, I'm not, I apologize. I'm not looking at factual numbers. I'm just paraphrasing, but they made, you know, this amount. And then they had this many, this many streams and it made this amount over here. And that total number fell very short with what they projected. Now, I don't care that Scarlett Johansson lost money that she never had because it was all based off of a guess. You can say, well, most Marvel films trend to making this much. So what I'm going to do is take a lower salary so I can dip my rich ass already hand into this and get a percentage of the theater profits. Well, I'm sorry. 
that's a risk. Just like putting your money in the stock market. You might lose it. It's not a guarantee. And it drives me nuts. And they kept saying, she lost $50 million. She, no, she didn't. She had the option to take her salary, which I think she goes for like 20, 25 million, I think is her paycheck. So she could have taken that and had that money guaranteed. But she chose to gamble it in Las, like in Las Vegas and say, no, nope, take a lower salary. I'm going to take more of the theater money. Yeah. But then it didn't perform well. And all these people said, well, it's because of streaming. Well, can you prove that? Because what I want to know is that of the people who streamed it and didn't go to the theater, how did you determine that every single one of those people would have gone to the theater to buy a ticket to thus then determine how much money you lost? Because the reality I is the film wasn't that great. And I'm not convinced that all of these people would have gone to see it in the theater and she would have made this $50 million figure that they keep coming up with that's not a real number because you have no data to prove that that was actually the dollar amount that she lost. I think these type of deals are very impactful to the theater business because it scares people consumers away it scares theater owners away you've got distributors you've got studios and when this kind of shit happens like people don't care about her money she's rich no one cares about her money but her so i don't give a shit if she lost money i paid theater money for black widow and i was let down okay so i'm part of the theater money yeah. but all these people i know streamed it but i asked them hey if this was not streaming and this was literally theater only, would you have gone? Every single person said no. So I don't buy it where they come up with these figures based on other films. And I think that is a huge detriment to the film industry right now. My opinion, of course. Yeah, I get, I get the, the it's predictions because they look at the trends of the, the previous movies and seeing what they projected there and, they were trying to add in the idea that, you know, okay, she's an original Avenger. It's going to add this and that. I mean, we'll never know. As you mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'll never know. I mean, you couldn't yeah. sleep. Yeah. For me, I mean, like I said, I get why she's – the the more the reason that I've read about why she was upset wasn't too much that the trend didn't come true. But, see, what was very interesting about Black Widow was that film was not designed like the other films – to be released in a COVID world. Sure, no, mean, no films were at well, that time. I mean, but what I mean is, Black Widow was kind of like the firstborn son that had to take all the hits of the dual streaming. Uh, he no, he's right, he's right. He did, he did. I'll admit to because it, I didn't know who, but I'll, I'll, I'll agree. It's kind of like what happened with the writer's strike a long time ago. Okay, okay, you know, I see people, where you're going with that because, now. Okay. Because people didn't own streaming rights to their own movie, their own shows, yeah. and their own projects. I got you. So that's, I think, was bi the bigger issue is that she was saying that if people, because you got to look at it like this, maybe there were people that were going to see it in theaters. I'm sure there were. More, more went to streaming, and that could have took money out of her pocket. But again, it's a what if. Oh, like, I, I I'm not can. suggesting that no one would have gone. There would have been a percentage of stream only that did go see it. But the projections they were coming up with, you can't determine that to yeah. then put a quantifiable value on how much money she lost. I understand. It, they're they're main they're mainly dinging Disney for because I mean that movie they when that movie was made there was no when the contracts were getting written up no mm -hmm. one was thinking yeah, oh, absolutely this is a dual release yeah so of course at Shang Chi Eternals they had this like okay we saw what happened here how do we make it better. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and then Spider Man had no choice because you have Sony and Disney. Yeah. And, yeah. Good luck trying to figure out which streaming service that goes on. Oh, God. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Can we get a good Venom movie, please? We've had two that were underperforming. I'm ready for an actual good one. I liked them all. But I, that's besides Venom the point. Carnage was a huge box office hit, though, John. I mean,. I mean I the amount of movie, <laughs> money a movie makes is not always indicative of the quality of the film. Oh, I know. Oh, I 100% I agree. But uh, you can't I'm say sorry. that it wasn't a hit. It was a huge I didn't, hit. I'm sorry. I miss. I didn't want to misrepresent. I, I'm not suggesting it wasn't a hit. I was simply referring okay. to quality of film. I, I should have been more specific. Oh, yeah. It's a shit film. So, <laughs> just, just let Marvel do it. Stop. Stop.
So hopefully we'll get it now that we had that our little teaser. But nonetheless, so I think with what happened with Black Widow was a great example of where things are trending, where things may not have gone correctly. But I also think for actors, it's an it's a wake up call to, you know, we can't always be traditional with things. We can't always be greedy with things. We have to evolve as a consumer with what we want to see and what our expectations are. But the film industry has to evolve in how it presents it to us. Mm -hmm meaning the actors and crew have to evolve to that. And then, of course, the method of deployment for us to see it has to evolve. So it's not just one thing. Everything is changing. And because it's still new right now, we don't have a total solution. It's why there's 75,000 different streaming services. It's why there's 10,000 different music streaming services. Look, when we get to Star Trek time, yeah, of course, things are going to be one one thing. Boom, there it is. You got it. It's just, there it is. But we're not there yet. We're at the beginning of that. We're like at, at like Captain Archer in Enterprise level where we still had laptops and no shields. Just <laughs> played it, you know. So we're just getting started, right? Yeah. 100, 200 years from now, so I'll be fucking figured out. But I, I think that it's just going back to my original point before we move on to our next topic is it's a total package. Everything, including us, have to evolve into something new or different than what we have now. And we're already in that transition, but I don't think people on all sides really see that. I think there's awareness and I think there are some people that see it, but I think there's a lot of denial. I think there's a lot of uh, egos in place. And I think there's a huge reluctancy for change because you've still got all these old money, old world dudes that are in charge. And it's like, yo, we got to evolve this shit and we can't while you're still making these stupid decisions. It's not the eighties anymore. We're not making commando. We're not making Rambo. Like people want something that has a little more, excuse me, substance, especially if they're going to pay $90 for their family of four to go out to the movie theater. Like, it can't just be an action spectacle. It can't just be a beautiful score. It can't just be an artistic vision. It has to be a total package if you want to get these people into the theater. Spider-Man did that, but no, no other films are really doing that right now. And Dude, where the fuck is Top Gun? How many times has that gotten delayed? Well, well, that's probably our next topic on films that are getting pushed back and delayed, so we can transition into that. Mm. So, yeah, there we well, go. <laughs> that's why I was nodding. I was like, I was yeah. like, you can keep going. You can keep going. But yeah, so just to give everybody an intro to this, um, yeah, due to COVID nineteen, many films have been shelved, and some have not been released. Some were uh, released poorly. Uh, some somehow found life, uh, as a digital release, you know, later on after a failed movie release. So again, this is, like I said, this was such an interesting thing because there was a treasure trove of movies that everybody wants to see Top Gun being one of the ones that was shelved. So the current release date for this film that is Vance, I think been pushed back a total of three rolling calendar years now. Yeah. Uh, yep. The movie has been done for over two years, like done, done, like it is done. It's just sitting there in a box. It's done. Uh, the current new release date is May 27th of this year. But I think that unless a couple other films produce really well, they're not going to release it. They're going to push it back again. They want to make money on this. And I understand that. I get that. This is a film that like anybody who saw Top Gun or is a fan is going to go see. I am. I love Top Gun. I know Vance isn't like huge into it like I am, but. I'm going to drag him to go see it with me because no, you're not. No, fuck. No, you're not. I am no <laughs> fucking way going to go see Top Gun in a goddamn oh. theater. I probably won't even watch it on TV. Quite oh. honest. What if I buy your ticket? Look out of here. here. What? Buy a ticket. <laughs> a ticket. Homeless, I will send a homeless person to show up and take that ticket and then sit and drink with you the whole time. It'll probably be well, more I fun because so I'll, I'll be seeing the whole fucking thing the whole time. I'll get you a triple Jack and Coke and I'll uh, pay for your ticket. Right. Oh, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Hardball. This is hardball. Just think about it. But uh, yeah. anyways, <laughs> so you know, what does that do for that studio and those actors that have put their time into it and they're waiting to make money on it? So that's another real issue we have that's more pandemic COVID related is that you have films that are done and studios and distributors are reluctant to release them because they have to make it like Top Gun has to make a certain amount of money to be profitable. And if this movie is not profitable, it, it, that's going to be a disaster. 
everybody is banking on this film being profitable and that's why they keep pushing it back but what happens if we've got another year another two years of covid left until like shit's really getting back to normal and i know that's kind of a uh cop out phrase but i mean that's really what it is so how long are they going to continue to push this film out and then at what point did they finally make the decision so i think this is another example of the film industry having to change too i can't recall a time in my 40 years of life where this has ever happened where we have finished films that are shelved because they're afraid they're not going to make their money back and or profit you have to go back to world war ii um casablanca being no, I'm not joking, uh, I, It's Cassis just funny. You were so specific. You're like, we yeah, have to go back to World that, War II. That's why we bring Grant on. He, he has this. He's ready to go. I love this. All right. Yeah, uh, Casablanca was in, 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 in on the shelf for a year, uh, I, I want to say. Uh, I think it uh, it didn't get released until the United States got into the war. It, it, it was first. It's like, whoa, you know, we can't release this now. This is kind of inflammatory. Then, you know, Pearl Harbor happens. And like, all right, let's. Let's get everybody all roused up and fighting, fighting the Nazis and all that kind of thing. That, you really have to go back that far to say, okay, we're going to hold on to this film because we don't really have a lot of people to be able to go out and see it right now. But I, I think even though Omicron really kind of hit a little bit after Spider-Man, you still yeah. saw some really good numbers with Dune and some of the oh, other yeah. De- December releases. Even with Dune being simulcast, you know, it, it still hit all it hit, it hit the numbers it needed to for them to finally hit the green light. And great job, Warner Brothers, again here. Um, you know what? Let, let's you're going to invest one hundred and sixty million dollars in half of a book of a film before you green light the second half to wait to see what the numbers are. You know what? They didn't do that with Lord of the Rings. They didn't do that with Marvel. They were already in, in getting rolling. So another reason, it's another part of the whole fuck up of Warner Brothers, which I'm not even going to delve into. That's a whole episode. That's a whole other episode. Right. Because I mean, Matrix, hello. Yeah. Great job. But, but when when Batman comes out, I think you're going to see the same numbers again. If not, you know, matching, I think you're going to be in that Spider-Man realm, no matter, you know, what n- next level shit we're going to be in, because people want to fucking see Batman. Batman's been sold a couple times, and now the anticipation has gotten almost like at a frenzy now. I mean, yeah, people have yeah. been excited about this for a long time now. You know, it's, it's almost like masturbation. You know, if they don't get to be able to get this pretty soon here, you're going to lose it, you know? I'm just gonna, <laughs> you're going to lose it. no i totally agree with you vance there look say what you want about the batman i think it looks fucking fantastic Uh, yeah i i think it's gonna be great look if it's bad i'll admit that it's bad on an on an episode on the air so everybody can hear me say i was wrong but you know what I, i think it's shaping up to be great i think the cast is fantastic i think our pat's gonna kill it uh, I like the vision that it's doing. I like that it's kind of year or two. Like yeah. it's it's going to be something we haven't necessarily seen. We're not doing the origin story. So it's it's nice that, that we're not. It's like that, uh, I, you know, like that was that, uh, that breath of fresh air I felt with with Homecoming. It was just like, oh, my God, I can finally get a Spider-Man film that's not bogged down by mm-hmm. all this baggage and all this shit like just show me in his prime high school spider-man being high school spider-man mm-hmm. and that's what they gave us and it fucking worked and i think that that's what we're gonna get with the batman i think we're gonna get the year two batman that we've wanted to fucking see and we're just gonna be like oh this is great yeah. i'm really excited for it so You know, I hope that the release stays tried and true. I hope that it doesn't get shelved or pushed back. I really hope Top Gun releases because I really want to see it. And, you know, if they ever make a sequel to Cocktail, I'll be there to see it, too. (laughs) Yeah, I love Cocktail. It's one of my favorite Tom Cruise movies. I said it. I I agree. I I understand. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's definitely... I like I said the Batman uh, thing. Got, if Batman got shelved, I would cry because like right now that is looking to be it. It it it, it looks like it's a, bit, a mix between the Long Halloween and um, Hush, and with a sprinkle of the Court of Owls. So with right now, yeah. <laughs> so, 
So right now, <laughs> right now they're taking, yeah, with like a dash because right, right now they're taking they're taking some storylines that are usually backseat to other bigger storylines when it's used in movies. So it's a very excited how they bring this about. So I'm but very- that look at that. So let's take that example and bring it back to what we're talking about. That level of excitement that people have is going to bring them to the theater. Oh yeah. Some of these other films that haven't done so well, and then we just do the blame game. I'm sorry, but there wasn't enough hype. And look, it's 2022. Shit's expensive. People don't want to pay for 90s action films anymore. And if you keep making 90s action films and releasing them in 2022, people aren't going to see it. We've moved on from that style of filmmaking. You have to make shit people want to actually see if you want them to go to the theater. I'm going to go all conspiracy theory here. Maybe Roland Emmerich started shit-talking Marvel films because Moonfall looks like a piece of shit that's going to release this week. Oh, and, yeah, he did that, didn't he? Yeah. And, I'm and interested in Moonfall, okay? Oh, I, I'm going to watch it. I am. Vance, what's the problem? It, it, I'm not saying it's going to be a blockbuster, but it, the, the trailer grabbed my interest. All right, guys. It looks stupid. How about that? How about that? How about that? It looks stupid. It looks like the dumbest idea I've heard it since, I don't know, what was the last time we had a, a celestial object falling and we had to blow it up out of the sky? Whatever the last one of those was. That's what this is. Part Wasn't that your melancholia film? Hey, you love melancholia. I mean, I I didn't love it, but I didn't you loved it. it. <laughs> I like that score. The score I loved. Yeah. Oh man, he was at. He was asking what that score was like ten times. I was man, and I still will because it's it's a haunting, haunting piece of symphony masterpiece. <laughs> it really truly is, and the word I use to describe it is haunting. But anyways. So uh, we're getting about out of time. How do we want to wrap this thing up? I feel like we've gone into a lot of side conversation, but we try to keep it to our main theme. So let's we bring it home. Did we forget next... a topic? What else did we, we kind of went into this already? We've kind yeah. of, this, this this topic has been the theme of the whole show. Of what it will take to get Hollywood yep. back to the billionaires club, which is give us the films we want. Right. You know, make make. When we're in theater, uh, you know, it's so crazy. Here's the be- the feeling we got when we saw Spider-Man. You know, when we saw those three Spider-Man swinging together, oh, God. everybody in the audience, I don't care who you are, race, creed, religion, whatever. We were all <laughs> as one. We were all as we were, one. We were united in that we moment. We were united. Yep. We, all, we were all together watching. You know what it was like? It was like that scene where, Tony McGuire stops the subway train and he passes out, and then we're all stamping in front of Doc Ock. You want him, you have to go through me. Right. We're all together. We're all and it together. was effortless to go through them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the COVID's Doc Ock. <laughs> yeah, he's just like done. <laughs> yeah. But my point is, like, that's what we want. We want an experience. Like, I'm going to remember seeing that movie. I still remember yeah. seeing Endgame. I still remember yeah. seeing the Dark Knight in theaters, that yeah. energy. When when it fade to black and Gary Oldman goes, the the Dark Knight. Oh, dude, Darth and I went to go see oh. that opening night, man, at a theater that doesn't exist anymore in Westerville. It was a great time. We lost our shit, but like that's the energy movies need to bring nowadays. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like I said, you can have your your nice art house films, but don't overprice them. Don't over. Yeah. You, no art house film, sorry, should be making two, should have a two hundred thousand dollar budget. I'm sorry, it should. All right, it shouldn't have a two hundred thousand <laughs> budget. Okay, or sorry, two two hundred million. Yeah, you were saying two hundred thousand. I'm like, oh, that's probably the budget. No, nah, sorry, two hundred million. I meant sorry, two hundred million. Okay. But even yeah, but like you you can't be getting that high. All right, uh, but that's my point. That's my that's my say in the matter. Hollywood sure. wants to get back to the billion dollars club. Make us invested in your product. Yes, absolutely. Stop releasing shit. You know, it's it's the whole thing. A polished turd is still a turd. So stop releasing polished turds. Do some market research because I don't know when the last time they did. Shit's changed. And then take that feedback and make films that are going to put butts in chairs. And then we'll be okay. But if you keep giving us shit that people are just like, eh, or... My favorite thing is that everybody bitches there's no originality left. There's no original movies left. Hollywood doesn't release original shit. No, they do. They do all the time. 
The problem is you don't watch it. And you know what you do watch? You go watch the reboots and the reimaginings and the 30 years later sequels that you complain about all the time. But then those are the only movies you spend money on. Very so true. it does take us as the consumer to also make better decisions because that then demonstrates to the filmmakers and the ones who finance it. Okay, this is what people want now. We're going to go over here. But until the consumer makes changes, nothing is going to change. There you have it. So in other words, I'm going to say this and hope that I don't die when I say this. Great power comes great responsibility. That's all I have to say. And so as consumers, do you? I know everybody's like getting away from me now. Like, all right, here's where the glider comes. It's where the glider comes. <laughs> it's where the violent carjacking is coming right now. Don't use those words unless you want to die. <laughs> All I'm gonna say is when she stood up, I was like, dude, she's totally dying. There's no way she's she dying. got up from that. She's, she's dead. She's gonna die. Here it is. And it happened. Yeah, uh, as soon as she muttered those words, I literally whispered to my wife, This bitch has a death wish. <laughs> I was like, You are but, gonna die now. And and now we've lost out on the nude Aunt May scene that we always wanted and never will have now. <laughs> But I, Vince, I didn't Sally Field get naked in a movie. You can have your cons consolation prize. You can get your runner up. I mean, not in Spider Man. Well, not in Spider Man, but still, I'm just saying it. You know, probably not gonna it. lie. The old broad in the first movie, she had legs. I'm gonna say <laughs> <her>. <laughs> Especially when her hair was all bunked up. My lord. Oh if yeah, I it's a balloon that does it for Jonah. On those legs, God damn. All right. But anyways, that's all the time we got today. I want to say thank you to everybody for tuning in today and talking with us. I want to thank everybody who is watching. I want to thank the commenters, uh, William, uh, Tom, Al, Shep. Uh, let's see, am I missing anybody? Uh, my buddy Nate was watching. What's Nate, up, Nate? Nate, thank you so much for watching. Uh, and I want to thank Vance, the producer, for joining us. He produces the goods. That's what he does. Always a blessing to have you on, my good friend. Always a blessing. Uh, an yeah. answer. So well, last before we get out of here, I want to make sure you all know to like and subscribe to this show on YouTube. And make sure you like our Facebook page. Make sure you give this video a good share. All right? We want everybody to know about this show. we got some more great show coming to you next week. So stay tuned. Watch our page. i got some fun stuff I'm going to be sharing this whole week. But until next time, I'm Jesse. And I'm John. And you've been sitting at the grown-ups table. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Take care, everyone. <laughs>